I'm good. How about you? Okay, I'm also good, friend. Okay, so currently you are in class eight, right? Yes. And I suppose your class has started or not? Sorry. Has your class started or not? Has your yes. classes begun? Yeah, yeah, it has started. Okay, 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 very good. Okay, so currently the chapel is going on in your class. Uh, well, uh, test is starting from Thursday of maths. It's uh, rational numbers, and we have completed that chapter. And our square and square roots is going on. Square and square roots is going on. Okay, yes. very good. So you have already completed rational numbers. Okay. Yes. Okay, so let's see how uh, how your chapter went. The rational number. Okay. okay. Your test are going to start from Thursday, right? Yes. Okay, so in your school, you have already completed rational number. Just do it. What you can share it. So you have already completed rational number. Okay. So do tell me what you mean by rational number. I'm sorry, what? What is the What does rational number mean? Okay. Can you define rational number? Okay. A number which can be written in the form of p by q, where p and q are integers and q is not equal to zero, then it's not a rational number. Very good. Okay. So let's say I say few numbers. If I take few numbers like one, three upon eight, minus five upon six, one upon zero, zero, two under three. Out of these values, which one is not a rational number? One by zero. Okay. Uh, three square. Okay. Not three square, root under three. Yeah, three, three square. Okay. These are not rational number. Not rational number. Okay, very good. Okay. But why root three is not a rational number? Because rational numbers can only be written in a fraction form or p by q. Okay, that's correct. But you see, in the definition of rational number, you see any integers in the form of p upon q, any integer which can be represented in the form of p upon q. So, by definition, p and q, both of them are integers, right? Yes. p and q are integers so here comes a term integer which i am guessing you are already familiar with what do we mean by integer sorry what do we mean by integers what are integers you see integers are collection of positive and negative whole numbers right yeah and they ranges from zero to infinity or yeah. from Minus negative of whole numbers up to infinity. Right. But if we compare root three from integers, does root three fulfill the definition of integers? Because integers are positive and negatives of whole, whole numbers. Right. We know that integers. <laughs> Are positive and negatives of whole numbers. Right? Positives and negatives of whole number. Okay. So whole numbers, if you write it like this: 0, 1, 2, 3, up to infinity, that is a collection of whole number. And we also say that positives and negatives of whole numbers. So negatives of whole numbers are minus one, minus two minus three up to infinity while root three is not an integer we can clearly see that because whole numbers are full number they are complete numbers they are not in the form of fraction right ifra 
Yes. Right. That's why root three is not a rational number. Talking about one upon zero, as the definition says, that where p and q are integers and q should not be equal to zero. That's why it's not a rational number. Okay. Okay. So in the previous class, you must have studied about certain geometrical figures also. Can you list some of them? Sorry, I'm not able to hear you clearly. Okay, I'm saying in your previous class, you must have studied about geometrical figures. Yes. Right. Okay. List some of the geometrical figures which you stand, uh, which you studied in seventh standard. Uh, you studied about perpendicular bisectors. Perpendicular bisector. Okay, and? Um, semicircles. Semicircle. Triangles. And triangles. Okay. So you listed three geometrical figures, but one of them is not a geometrical figure. Perpendicular bisector, that is that in itself is not a figure. Keep that in mind. Right, Dufra. Because let's see, if I have got a triangle and its name is triangle ABC and side BC is bisected perpendicularly, then that, if we name it AD, then this AD is called the perpendicular bisector of triangle ABC. So perpendicular bisector, that is not a geometrical figure, right? Okay. So you talked about semicircle, right? It looks like this. What's the angle formed by semicircle? If I have got a point over here, zero, that is at the center of this semicircle, then what is the angle around this center? It is. It is? 120 degrees. No, it is 180 degree. Why is it so? Because if I were to draw a complete circle, Oh, that is it? right. The angle in a circle is 360 degree, the whole angle. That is 360 degree. And if I were to cut down this triangle, this circle into half and form a semicircle, then that is very obvious. That the angle is going to be how much? 180 degrees. 180 we'll, degrees. We'll obtain it by dividing by two. Exactly. 360 divided by two will give you 180. Very good. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about triangles as well. Can you list the types of triangles? Isosceles, equilateral, and... Uh, and there's one more. If all the sides of the triangle are not equal, what do we call them? If suppose there's a triangle uh, in which none of the sides are equal, like this. Two, four. Good. Such type of triangle in which none of the sides are equal to each other, that is called a scalene triangle, right? Right, Ifra. What about equilateral triangle? All the sides are equal. All the sides are equal. And what about isosceles triangle? Only one of the sides are equal. Only one pair of sides is equal. Only two of the sides are equal. So suppose if I have a triangle like this, okay, this side BC measures, let's say five, and these two measure four, four centimeter each. In this triangle, two sides are equal. Hence they are called isosceles triangle. Or if I have a triangle, like this, in which all the sides are equal, four, four, four. That is equal to the triangle. Okay. There's one more property which is equal in an equilateral triangle. Can you point that? Pythagoras property? No, Pythagoras property. For that, you need to have ninety degree in a triangle. But in an equilateral triangle, apart from their sides being equal one more property is found equal in that that is their angle right okay angle, angle and side, and side, 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 side. four properties are there uh, if your voice is not clear can I'm you repeat saying, what you just said yeah 
I'm saying that four properties are there for it: side, 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 angle, side, angle, side, angle, and angle, angle. Okay, that is the property for congruency. That is how we equate. We find whether the two triangles are similar or not. But here I'm talking about the angles being equal. Okay, before even we discuss about the angles, do you know what is the total sum of the angles found in a triangle? Sum of three angles in a triangle. Right. You see, there are three triangles and three. There are three angles in a triangle. One, two, and three. If I add angle one plus angle two plus angle three, what do I get? Ninety degrees. Uh, if your voice is not clear, please repeat. Ninety degrees. No, it's not ninety. Degree. It is one eighty degree. Okay. So remember this: that sum of all the three angles of a triangle is one eighty degree. Okay. So in an equilateral triangle, you will find two things to be equal. One, all sides are equal. And another property is all angles are also equal. All angles are also equal. So let's draw an equilateral triangle. Let's say this is an equilateral triangle ABC. Okay. And its angle are angle one, angle two, and angle three. And as we know that all angles are equal here, that is angle one is equal to angle two equals to angle three. All the three are three angles of an equilateral triangle are equal, right, Ifra? Yes. Which I just discussed. And we also know that sum of all the angles of a triangle is equal to one eighty degree. So if I were to find the value of angle one, angle two, and angle three here, can you find the values of angle one, angle two, and angle three given in this figure? Degrees. Each of them is going to be 60 degrees. Very good. Because 60 plus 60 plus 60 will give you 180 degree. Very good. Okay. Okay. And you tell me uh, what else have you studied in class 7, the standard? Yes. Uh, practical geometry, which I, you just asked. Uh, and then integers, algebraic expressions. Um, okay, let's talk about algebraic expressions. Yeah, algebraic expressions. So, what do you mean by algebraic expressions? What are they? They have variables in it. Okay, one thing that is variables in it. There are terms in it. Terms, or you can say numbers. Yes. Okay, algebraic expression basically consists of two things. One is the variable and the one is the numbers. Okay. So this algebraic expression is used for what purposes? You see, we have got so many formulas in mathematics, right? Let's see if I have got a square here. This is a square. And each of its sides is a centimeter. We know that all the sides of a square are equal. And if I were to t uh, tell you to find me a formula to find the area of this square, yeah. we know that area of a square equals to what? What is the formula to find area of a square? A into A. A into A. So A into A, that will give you A square. Now find me the perimeter of this square. Perimeter of the square. We know that the formula to find perimeter of the square is 4 into side. 4 multiply its side. So here in this case, the formula to find the uh, to find the perimeter of this square is 4a. Now, let's drive the relation between this 4a and this algebraic expression. Is this 4a not, fulfill, not fulfilling uh, the definition of an algebraic expression? It is containing a variable also, that is a. It is containing a number also that is four. Yeah, Ibra. 
Yes. So algebraic expressions, for what purposes we use it? To derive formulas, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there's one question for you from algebraic expression. Okay. <clears throat> so question goes like this. The age of Raman's father is seven times his son. Okay. Using a variable denote his father's age. Okay. The question is the age of Raman's father is seven times his son. Using a variable denote his father's age. Okay. Or we can say using a algebraic expression. Using a algebraic expression denote his father's age. Yes. Okay. Solve this. You have forgot the answer? Yes, I am doing that. Yeah. Okay. What is this? Seven times. If we take the sense, uh, if we do not send uh, with a variable s, so it will be seven into s, which is seven s. You can take any variable. Okay, so if we take sun's age as x, or in this case as this age s, we can take s as well. So let's say that sun's age is as then his father's age is going to be seven s seven s father's age is going to be seven s that is very correct okay <clears throat> okay if i add some variation to this question like let's say that the age of raman's father is the age of uh, raman's father will be twice his age uh, or let's say uh, thrice his age in five years, then what can we say? Keeping the variable C. Let me write down the question.
okay so the question says that the age of raman's father will be three times his son's age after 10 years find the age of father after five years if the present age of raman is s that is s okay don't get it mistaken by five okay for solve this question uh it has to be 10 uh, it has to be 10 years after 10 years okay Yeah, Fred, that's a very simple question. Okay, but I have made it complex, but the answer is answer can be found very simply. Okay, have you got the answer? Yeah, one minute. P S plus ten, and then you have to find it the real P. No, that is wrong. Because read the question again. Okay, the age of Raman's father will be three times his son's age after ten years. Question says that after a period of ten years, his age will be three times. The question does not say that after ten years his age will be three times plus ten years. The question does not say is that his age will be three times plus 10 years. The question instead says that after 10 years, his age is going to be thrice of his son's age. Getting the question. Read the question once again. Read the question. Yeah, if I read the question. One to read loudly. Yeah, read it loud. The age of Raman's father will be three times his son's age after 10 years. Find the age of father after 10 years if the present age of Raman is S. Okay. So what do you get from the question? The question basically means to say that after 10 years, the age of father is going to be three times the E and is going to be three times the present age of his son. So the present age of his son is what? Present age of son is S, right? So after 10 years, after 10 years, according to question, his father will be three times his age. Okay. So after 10 years, his father is going to be three times his age. Okay. His son's age with so the present age of his son, the present age of son is as so after 10 years, it is going to be three years. 
Let's take another example so that you will be able to understand this question. Let's say presently the age of your father, let's say it's 40 years. Okay. And after 20 years, he's going to be double your age. So let's say at presently, at present your age is I. We take a variable and we denote your present age with I. It's your present age. Okay. And I say that after 20 years, your father will be five times your age. Okay. So presently your age is I. After uh, after 20 years, your father will be five times your age. So this time period that is 20 years does not matter here. What matter is how many times your father's age is going to be in comparison to you. That is going to be 5i. I hope you got the question. Yeah. Yeah. So it will be 5i and then it will be equal to 20 years? No, that is not going to be 20 years. Here 20 years is just denoting a time period that after we could have said uh, it would have simply said that after, after some years, your father's age is going to be five times. So here, instead of saying after some time, I took 20 years. So after 20 years, your father will be five times your age. So we do not include the time period. Yeah, we don't have to include the time period. But if the question was like this, if the question was like this, let's say, If I say, if Ra's present age is I, present age is I, after some time, his father's age will be 20 years more than if Ra's age. So in this case, we could have simply said that his father, uh, your father's age is going to be 20 plus I after some time. Okay. So that is the question. Okay. Okay. Coming back to the question number two, did you get the question? Here, yes, this 10 years, it's just denoting a time period that after some time, uh, Raman's father's age is going to be three times his son's age. Okay. So examiner puts these sentences, examiner put, uh, just to confuse you, I put 10 years over here. Okay. So 10 years has nothing, has got nothing to do with the answer. Okay. So this 10 years here basically is denoting a time period. Okay. So you must have studied about perimeter and area also in your previous class. Right. Yeah. So okay. I would like to... Uh, say that uh, since my exam my test is starting from thursday and it's all about ratio numbers so it's better if we study ratio numbers yeah sure very good okay we can stick to rational number i was just checking with uh, how your class seven went and uh, whether the basics are clear or not okay from okay talking about rational number This is a term related to rational number. In rational number, you must have studied about equivalent rational number. Yeah. Right? Yes. We studied about equivalent rational numbers last year. You studied about this uh, last year as well. Okay, very good. Let's say dual on 14. If I say you to write at least three rational, uh, three equivalent rational numbers, what would be they? Question is 16 by 18 and 18 by 20. What are this? 16 by 18? No, no, 16. Yeah. Yeah, six, 16 by 18, 18 by 20, and 20 by 22. 18 by 20 and 20 by 22. Yeah. Okay. So, as per the definition of equivalent rational number, 
uh, all the numerator and all the denominator value in their simplest form, it has to be same, right? Let's check that. Okay. Okay, how do we check that? I guess you already know. Okay. So the simplest form of 12 upon 14 can be written as? Six by seven. Six by seven? Okay. What about 16 upon 18? Is it also equal to six upon seven or not? It's not equal to. It's not equal. Then how can it be a equivalent number, equivalent rational number? The condition for equivalent rational number is that the simplest form of the numerator and denominator has to be has to be same. If I were to write twelve and fourteen and twenty four and twenty eight, in this case we will find that the simplest fraction is equal. That is 12 divided by 14, that will give you six upon seven and 24 divided by 28, that will also give you six by seven, right? Right, Ifra? Yes. Okay. Try one more, try solving one more question related to equivalent number. Okay. 13 and here I write, Tool. Write at least three equivalent number. Thirteen by twelve is itself in its simplified form. No, yeah, that's a, that is in the simplest form possible. Thirteen by twelve. Sorry, sorry. I meant thirteen by thirty-six. Thirteen by thirty-six. No, <clears throat> that will not be a, an equivalent uh, rational number because you see, if the questions ask is to find the equivalent rational numbers, whether it be five equivalent rational numbers or ten or any given number, what you simply do, let's say thirteen upon twelve. That was our question. We simply multiply the numerator and denominator with the same value. Let's say multiply them by two. That will give you 26 upon 24, right? Similarly, we can multiply them, both the numerator and denominator by three. In this will by, uh, three itself. Yeah. So like this, you can get so many, uh, so many equivalent numbers, right? And if you simpli uh, simplify them, if you have enough time left in your examination, you can also check whether the whether uh, they are equal or not. So all the equivalent fraction, they should be equal to 13 by 12. 26 upon 24 equals to 39 upon 36. All of them should be equal to 13 upon 12 because 13 upon 12 is the simplest possible form. Right, that is the simplest fraction. So let's check that 13 and here we have got 2. 13 into 339 and that is 12. So you see all the numerator values and all the denominator values, all of them are equal. Okay, so like that we can check our answer as well. Okay, so from the chapter, rational number, uh, what are the portions in which you are having confusion? I don't have any confusion. Okay, very good. Okay. Hello guys, if you have any Wi-Fi connection to your neighbors or any of them, you can use the password. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah.
Okay, so, so there are only two uh, two exercises in the chapter rational number. Okay, so if I ask you to find ten rational numbers between minus two upon five and one upon two, see question number four of exercise one point two. See this question. Yeah, Ifra. Question number four: Find ten rational numbers between minus two upon five and one upon two, and try solving that. Yeah, Ifra, am I audible? Yes, okay. Hello. Okay. Yeah, solve question number four. You just have to find ten rational numbers. Okay, don't find uh, don't find ten. Just find five rational numbers between minus two point five and one point two. Yes, I have found them. Uh, okay, three by ten, minus two by ten, minus one by ten, two by ten, three by ten. Okay, can you repeat again? Three by ten. Minus three by ten, minus two by ten, minus one by ten, two by ten, and then three by ten. Okay, that is correct. Okay, so what are the steps here? What is the first step which we have to do here? We have to take the LCM of five and two. Five and two. Okay, that is basically in doing so we also equate the denominators. Yeah. Right. Both the denominators of these fractions become equal, and then it becomes very simpler to find the value. Okay. So the chapter is very short. You have got only two exercises. Okay. And uh, there's few things here like the additive inverse, reciprocal. Okay. Let's discuss that as well. Let's say if I have a value minus one, what is the reciprocal of minus one? Minus. Minus one is also a rational number. Right, it can be written like this: minus one upon one. Okay, so what is the reciprocal of minus one? One by minus one. One by minus one. One by minus one, but that's not how. That's not how we write a rational number. Uh, that's not how we write a fraction. Okay, because the standard form to write our rational number is like this. If it has if it has got a negative value, you write it like this: minus one upon one. So minus sign has has always to be in the numerator. So you cannot put the negative value on the denominator side. Okay, Vira. So the reciprocal of minus one is minus one itself. Okay, because minus one upon one, it is same as minus one. Did you get it, or shall I repeat this? No, no, I understood. Okay, very good. Okay, and what about additive inverse? What are the additive inverse? Additive inverse in sense adding a zero or a number to a number that it gives the same value. Additive inverse, but that is uh, what you are explaining. That is additive identity actually. That if we add zero to any number, we get the same number back. Right. You are actually talking about additive identity. That is zero. I'm talking about additive inverse. Like if I have got a number five, what is is uh, its additive inverse? Right. 
say that I have five here and I need to add such a number to it that my resultant value is going to be minus zero. Four. Minus five? Minus five. So basically additive inverse are the negatives of whole numbers, right? Are the positives of negative numbers? Yeah, you can say that as well. Okay, positives of negative numbers. So the additive inverse of five is minus five. And as you see, the positives of the negative number. So the additive inverse of minus five is going to be five. And while the additive inverse of five is going to be minus five. That is very correct, okay. So there were a few things more that you know, which you must have studied in your previous class also. Let's discuss that as well. Quickly tell me what are the difference, what is the difference between an altitude and a median? Altitude. altitude. Yeah. Median uh, is the line which divides. Both of them does the work of division. Both of them divides the triangle. What is the basic difference, Ifra? If I have a triangle, okay, if I have got a two triangles over here, let's say. Okay. Okay, so I have got two triangles over here, triangle one and triangle two. Okay, and I'm drawing the figure, I'm drawing the altitude and median in these two triangles and you have to actually tell me which one is a median and which one is a altitude. Okay, from. Okay, so is CO, a median or an altitude? It's a median. CO, this line here, this line, is it a median or an altitude? It's a median. It's a median. No, that is wrong. Actually, this FM is a median. This FM which you see here, that is actually median because you see in a triangle, the line joining the opposite vertex and the, that line which divides the opposite side at an angle of 90 degree, that is called an altitude. What did I say? That in a triangle, the line which divides, uh, the line joining from the vertex to the opposite side and which divides it at an angle of 90 degree, that is actually called an altitude. So this is 90 degree here. And in the second figure, you will see that this FM is not an angle of 90 degree, right? Just slightly more than 90 degree. Okay. So here also, median is dividing the, uh, dividing the triangle into two, dividing the side DE into two halves. Okay. Both GM and ME are equal here. Right, Ifra? No. Altitude is basically that line in a triangle, which is joined from the opposite vertex and that side, and which bisects the side uh, at an angle of 90 degree. Okay, the sides could be equal or not equal. Did you got it or is it confusing? Sorry, the sides uh, couldn't be equal as this? In the case of altitude, if I have got an altitude, let's say, this is an altitude, AD is the altitude here. Okay. So AD is being joined from the vertex A and it is cutting the side BC at D at an angle of 90 degree. So BD and BC need not necessarily be equal. When will an, uh, when will an altitude divide the opposite side into two equal halves? When the triangle is an equilateral triangle, right? This is an equilateral triangle. And in this case, if we draw altitude like this, the sides are going to be divided into two equal halves. Here, the side BD will be equal to DC. 
right right if i getting it yes okay and one more question to you in which case median and altitude will be equal in a triangle in which triangle in which triangle median and altitude are going to be equal in the case of an equilateral triangle you see this is the altitude here and this is the median here as well here as well okay because it's an equilateral triangle okay and if you how will you how else will you draw the median median is basically the line joining uh, the angle and the opposite side and median basically divides the opposite side into two equal halves right if from okay so in a triangle how many medians and altitudes can be there uh it can medians can be three three and altitude can also be three only okay okay fra so you have already uh, completed the first chapter that is rational number okay i want you to actually actually solve the question from the mathematics example as well have you seen this book mathematics example this has got some very good questions in it you can solve that as well stop using your old boring keyboard today yeah sorry about that it keeps popping on yeah see the exercise number 1 here let me just open here yeah yeah see the screen yes yeah you have to solve question number 1 from question number 1 to question number 10 that will be part of your assignment okay okay so before we end the class i want you to solve question number 9 right now the additive inverse of minus 7 upon 19 is which option is correct here 